So in the previous lecture, I showed you that for the typical solutions of partial differential equations that are smooth mostly everywhere and then maybe have singularities in small parts of the domain, that among all of the possible ways how you could think about approximating these sort of functions, these solutions of PDEs, that piecewise polynomial approximation is a particularly good way because it is able to isolate the areas where something goes wrong, like singularities or kinks, from those areas where um, the solution is smooth. And so I illustrated this to you through a series of examples in 1D and 2D, where you could see visually that if you make the size of the subintervals or the size of the cells in 2D and 3D, if you make these cells smaller and smaller, the approximation becomes better and better. In other words, the difference between the function that I want to approximate and the approximant become smaller and smaller in some sense. And what I would like to do in this lecture is that I give you a theoretical basis to make that claim as well, so that we look at mathematics that shows and indeed the difference between the approximate, the original function and the approximate goes to zero under certain circumstances, or in certain circumstances. So this is lecture uh, 3.91. And I would like to um, call this the theory of piecewise polynomial approximation. Okay, so the um, idea is this. So I have a function f of x that later on we will consider as the solution of the PDE. And I'm just going to show this to you in 1D. Um, so it is a function that lives on an interval a to b, for example. And I'm going to call um, the approximant um, fp of x. That's also a function of a and b. And for the moment, I'm assuming that it is one single polynomial for the entire interval a to b. So it has polynomial degree p. And as an interpolant, um, so I, I want to think of this function fp of x as something that interpolates f of x for the moment, um, it equals f of x at p plus one point. So for example, for a linear function that I want to use to approximate a um, function f of x, it has to equal f at two points. So just to give you an example, um, if I have the function sine pi x on the interval minus one to one, that's this purple curve here, then if I choose two points, for example, minus 0 0.75 and plus 0 0.25, then this sort of uh, yellow-orange curve here, that is the interpolant. That's the approximant of the function that, um, so that's the approximant of the um, purple curve. And it is equal to the purple curve at these two points um, that are marked in red. And so that's for a piecewise linear function. I can use, of course, a piecewise quadratic function. So then I need to choose three points. I can use a um, piecewise cubic function, then I need four points where the two are equal. And so in this case, I choose them equidistant. That means equ equally spaced in the interval. But it is not at all um, important. I could choose any four points, for example, these ones here. And um, I can define my interpolant that way as well. So um, the point I want to make is that from these pictures, you already see that if I choose more and more and more points of these xi's corresponding to a larger and larger uh, polynomial degree, I can expect or hope at least that this orange curve comes closer and closer to this purple curve. And that is indeed true. Uh, you can write down a theorem that's not terribly difficult to prove. Fundamentally, it's just Taylor expansion, as it always is in numerical analysis. And um, the theorem, in this case, the, the one that I state you might not be optimal, but it illustrates the point that I want to make. Namely, if I look at the difference between this function f of x, that's the one that I try to approximate. And fp of x, that's the interpolant. So I look at the difference between these two functions and then I take the maximum over this interval. So that's the maximum distance between these two functions. And if you look at this here, so the maximum would probably be attained somewhere here. So that's the maximum vertical distance between these two functions. And there is probably another point over here where that is true too. 
So if I look at this maximum distance between these two functions, then I can bound this, I can prove that it is less than or equal the maximum of the pth derivative of the function that I try to approximate, divided by p factorial times the length of the interval to the power of p. So let me try to interpret this for you. So um, the important part that um, you should uh, recall is that um, it, um, we want to consider the case where p becomes larger and larger. And so I should uh, consider the case, um, well, so how does this change? How does this part change with p? And how does this part change with p? And for the moment, I would like to assume, for example, that this upper part here is some sort of, well, a constant that depends on f and p. So um, you think of this as a constant times b minus a to the p divided by p factorial. And so if you look at this, then let's pretend for a moment that the c of f and p does not grow too quickly. And in that case, um, we know that, um, well, let's say b minus a is 2, like in the example that I showed you with the sine function, 2 to the p divided by p factorial, for example, it goes to 0 if p becomes larger and larger. And in fact, that's true for any um, size b minus a. Even if b minus a is 1,000, 1,000 to the p divided by p factorial eventually goes to 0. Okay, So what we, sh what we see from the theorem is that Assuming that the c of f and p does not grow too quickly, then the difference between the original function and its, piece, its polynomial approximant, its, its interpolant, goes to zero as p becomes large. The problem is that there are functions for which the c of f and p does grow quite rapidly. And um, the typical example that we always use in our numerical analysis courses is if you consider the function f of x equals 1 over x on the interval 0 0.5 to 1.5. And the important part to point out here is that this function is actually perfectly nice on this interval 0 0.5 to 1.5. It just decreases gently. But um, the problematic uh, location for this function 1 over x, of course, is at x equals 0. But x equals 0 is not, in fact, part of that interval. Okay? So even though this function is perfectly nicely behaved in the interval that we care about, you will see that this constant grows quite rapidly. Namely, if I look at the maximum of the pth derivative of 1 over x, so the pth derivative is minus 1 to the p times p factorial times x to the minus p plus 1. And then I need to take the maximum over all possible x's in this interval 1 half to 3 over 2. Okay, And um, so this is 1 over x to the p plus 1. It takes its maximum for x equals 1 half. And um, so I'm going to get a factor 2 to the p plus 1 out of this times p factorial. Okay, So in other words, this uh, constant c of f and p actually grow, grows really rapidly, 2 to the p times p factorial. That's really rapidly. And so if you put this constant into the interpolation estimate, then first the p factorial cancels this p factorial, and what's left is still this t to, 2 to the p here. Okay, So um, I'm going to end up with 2 to the p plus 1 p factorial divided by p factorial times 2 to the p. And I made a mistake here. This should actually have, sorry, times b minus a, 1 to the p. So it should have been actually 2 to the p plus 1 here and 2 to the p plus 1. But that doesn't matter that much. The point simply being that the right-hand side of this inequality grows with p. And so in other words, even if I take more and more and more points at which this fp interpolates f, the theorem does not actually guarantee that fp comes closer to f um, over time. right? And so what you get out of this is that there are functions for which this attempt at interpolating on the entire interval with just one polynomial, with, high, with one high polynomial degree function, is not actually guaranteed to converge. right? So the difference between f and fp is only less than or equal to something that grows exponentially. And of course, in practice, you would have to ask, well, is this really how the left-hand side behaves, or is it just an artifact of 
the, um, of the, the, the theorem that I gave you or the proof that I used to show this theorem. But there are indeed functions that look perfectly nice where if I take more and more and more points to interpret, interpolate, the interpolant actually becomes worse and worse and worse. Okay, so the theorem um, suggests to us, it doesn't prove, but it suggests at least that there are functions for which global polynomial um, interpolation is bad. So what you get out of this is that whether or not this approximation with one high degree polynomial um, is a good or a bad idea depends on the function that we try to interpolate. Um, and um, of course, well, we don't know the solution of the partial differential equation, so that's undesirable because we will not know a priori whether that will work or will not actually work. And um, so from a practical perspective, that seems undesirable because we will not be able to show that that is a useful approach. So what do we do instead? Um, you recall these sort of pictures where um, I want to take the um, interval size. Um, so instead of just one big interval in, on which I interpolate um, this, uh, fun this green function by the purple function, I want to make this a piecewise approximation and make the interval smaller. And so now let's look at this. Um, so what I have now is that um, the maximum of this difference here is certainly less than or equal to the maximum over all of the subintervals. Okay, and so all I need to do is I need to look at the interpolation error on each subinterval separately, right? So the maximum difference between f and f of h, what I'm now calling fhp, fhp being the piecewise interpolant. So the maximum difference is bounded by the maximum over all of the subintervals, and on each subinterval, now what do I have? Okay, so I have still this sort of constant divided by p factorial, but then I have b minus a over n. That's the size of the um, of these subintervals. If I have n subintervals, then each of those has length b minus a over n, and so I need to look at b minus a over n to the power of p. And the way you should read this one now is, well, I'm saying I keep p fixed, okay? So I'm going to consider simply um, quadratic interpolation or in the, in the picture, linear interpolation. So p equals two or p equals one, okay? So p is fixed and the only thing that changes now is n, that I consider what happens if I choose more and more and more subintervals, okay? And so if I rewrite this formula here, then, um, that b minus a to the p is a constant. I'm going to put this over here. f is always the same, p is always the same, p factorial is always the same. So this term here simply gives me a constant. And then I'm left with one over n to the p. And that really does converge to zero um, because if I uh, keep p fixed and I make n uh, larger and larger and larger, then one over n to the p goes to zero. So in other words, no matter what the function is, as long as c f comma p is a finite constant, the whole thing goes to zero. The right-hand side goes to zero if I make the number of intervals larger. And as a consequence, um, the left-hand side must also go to zero, right? And so that, that means that for larger and larger and larger numbers of intervals, the difference between f and its piecewise polynomial approximant will go to zero. So, um, just um, to reiterate this, so the, the fundamental estimate says that the maximum difference between f and fhp um, um, behaves like this. And what I introduce here is h. So we typically call the size of these subintervals, or maybe the diameter of cells in 2D, we, we denote that by the letter h. And so b minus a over n, that is the size of each subinterval. That's what I'm going to call h. And um, that's also where this letter uh, H here comes from. So F H comma P is the piecewise polynomial interval on a mesh where the maximum size of the cells is H and the polynomial degree is P. And so um, what I have over here is that um, I have some constant as a function, uh, well, a, a constant for a given F and P, and then I have H to the P and what I'm 
thinking of conceptually is that I can make this h smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if h becomes small, h to the p becomes even smaller, arbitrarily small. Okay. And so I can make that right-hand side as small as I want, and that means that the left-hand side also becomes as small as I want. And for later purposes, I would like to introduce two other um, estimates of the error, namely, um, so this is the maximum deviation here. So that's sort of the biggest possible error, or the biggest error I will encounter. But I might also be interested in something like an average error. Um, and so the average error, we typically measure that in what's called the L2 norm. The L2 norm is the integral over this interval of the difference between the original function f and its interpolant squared. And then I, at the end, take the square root of this. And it's denoted as f minus fhp. And these double norms are the L2 norm, if nobody um, says anything different. And with a little bit more work, I can show that that is, again, some constant as a function of P and F, okay, but P and F are fixed, times H to the P plus 1. So what that really means is that the average error converges like H to the P plus 1, and that's even better than the H to the P. And that makes sense, because if you look at these pictures, there's always some places where the error is large, but on average, the error will actually be substantially smaller than that. So that's the L2 norm, and here is something that we call the gradient norm, or sometimes the energy norm, or sometimes the um, H1 semi-norm. So it looks at the difference between the gradient of F and the gradient of this interpolant. Um, so it's um, the integral, again, of the difference between gradient of F, gradient F, HP. Um, I take the square of this, and then at the end, I take the square root. So it is something like the average difference in gradients between these two. And for that one, I can prove that it converges like h to the p. And I want to introduce these things because these are the fundamental, these three things are the fundamental um, interpolation estimates that we will always use. That um, the maximum difference, the, the average difference, and the average dis difference in the gradients, these are tools that we will use when we look at the finite element approximation. And, um, so uh, you will see these in numerous other occasions, and what we will do in one of the next lectures then is that uh, we relate the error in the finite element solution to the error in an interpolant. Um, so it will turn out that the finite element solution is always at least as good as the interpolant. And for the interpolant, I can use this sort of estimate here, the one that you're seeing right now. I should also note that um, the estimates that you see here, so I state them in 1D, uh, and so there's a maximum over an interval, there's an integral over an interval, an integral over an interval. This sort of estimate also works uh, in 2D and in 3D, and um, we will use that later on for um, estimating the error in any arbitrary dimension. So with this, I um, would say, um, that covers the uh, basic interpolation estimates that I wanted to show you, and we will use these later to estimate the error in the finite element approximation.